I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. It is 29 October, 1962. The world is breathing again. For the last weeks, and it's indeterminate how long, they have, everyone has been at the edge of a nuclear nightmare. The closest the United States and the Soviet Union came to critical provocations that would have led the presumption to nuclear warfare. A new book, The 14th Day, October 29th, JFK and the Aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis by David Coleman, who is an historian, takes advantage of tapes, audio tapes, that the President of the United States, John Kennedy, made during the, the meetings of the 13 days and continued in his conversations with the Central Committee called XCOM after the event, from the 14th day all the way into the new year, 1963, February of 1963. I welcome and congratulate the author, David Coleman. David, a very good evening to you, and thank you for this. Based on the secret White House tapes, so before we plunge into who's at the table for XCOM on the 29th of October, there are two unknown characters, Mikey 1 and Mikey 2. What are they, and where do we believe they are? Good evening to you. Good evening to you. It's a pleasure to be with you, John. Um, right, as you mentioned, the Kennedy secretly taped while he was on, on, in office, and he was taping meetings, which is a lot of what this book is based on. But he's also taping telephone calls. So he actually has two different recording systems going on. And it's very important to point out, he and very, very few uh, people around him know about this recording system. Most of the people who were caught on the tapes had no idea they were being recorded. Most of these executive committee of the National Security Council meetings that you're talking about, um, which are sort of his highest level advisors, he gathered in the cabinet room. He would sit in the middle of the long side of the table next to the Rose Garden, and he would have the Secretary of State on one side and the Secretary of Defense on the other. We believe the, re the microphones were in the drapes behind him. Um, there was a little button near his chair, on the, it was on the table near his chair, which was actually the button that he could use to turn the tape on or off. There was no light switch to say it was, you know, green was on, red was off, or anything like that. So every now and then he'd mix it up and accidentally turn it on when he wanted to turn it off and things like that. But he could push this button, and no one else knew what he was doing. It just looked like a little buzzer that would summon a secretary or something like that. But he could push this button and secretly capture the recordings that were going on, the, sorry, secretly record the conversations right. that were going on in the room. And why was he doing this? We're not entirely sure. The best speculation we have or the best evidence we have is that he was probably preparing material for his memoir. Mm -hmm. The fact of these recordings, we have them now. You are going to publish additional work about this, and others have been publishing over the years. These recordings, do, they, do the recordings go on for uh, 60 minutes? Are they five-minute bursts? How, how, how can you generalize for us, David? Yeah, there's two different sets. The meeting recordings can sometimes go on for two or three hours, basically as long as Kennedy kept the tapes rolling. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes he would get bored in a meeting and realize that he really didn't want to record this and turn it off after a few minutes. Sometimes he would let it roll for two hours. Telephone recordings, he generally captured a whole conversation, uh, but those telephone conversations are generally shorter, of course. Of course, XCOM. Now, at the table are the, is the ex, uh, is the executive committee. What is XCOM, and who is there, and what is their problem on the 29th of October, David? Right. The XCOM was um, a fancy name for a group of advisors that was, that was mainly made up of his regular National Security Council advisors. But when he was first shown photos of the missiles in Cuba and on October 16, 1962, he wanted some other people at the table who were not part of the National Security Council, and the, the most, probably the most important person there um, in that category was Robert Kennedy, his brother, the Attorney General. And as Attorney General, he was not a member of the National Security Council. But after the Bay of Pigs debacle the previous year, Kennedy wanted his brother's counsel and wanted his brother in the room. And so he brought together advisors that was basically the National Security Council augmented. And it, the, by giving it a different name, he was able to bring in people um, on an ad hoc basis. At one point, he brought in former Secretary of State Dean Acheson. Mm -hmm. um, and, but basically, it's his senior National Security Council advisors that he wants in the room to help him grapple with this problem. Wise man. Now, did XCOM exist before the 16th of October, 1962? It did not. And technically, it didn't, wasn't named the XCOM, I think, until about uh, October 20th. But no. 
Before that, it did not exist. All right. We have Rusk and McNamara, uh, President of the Table, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. And then uh, components include McGeorge Bundy, National Security Advisor, Ted Sorensen, Special Advisor to the President. Are various people present at times and not present at other on the tapes? You can tell who's there and who's not, or is it a guessing game all these years later? Um, It's a guessing game. Well, there's two parts of evidence that as a historian we can go back to look at. The president's secretaries and keepers do keep a detailed list of the president's activities during the day, and they will write to the minute about meetings that he takes place. And a lot of the time they will list participants who are in the room. Um, and also, there are also note takers in a lot of these meetings. So we, right. those are fairly good lists. But otherwise, it, when those are incomplete or they don't exist, then we have to go back and just listen to the voices and learn the voices to find out who was there. All right. All right. 29th of October. The problem is that the president, in exchanges with Nikita Khrushchev, who is the premier of the Soviet Union, the two states locked in deep into cold water now with missiles primed, with nuclear submarines primed, with surveillance equipment, armies deployed. Uh, Vietnam is yet a nascent problem, not a profound one for the Kennedy administration. And the Soviet Union at this point has rolled over all of Eastern Europe and is quite confident, although it has years ahead to deteriorate. The problem is over Cuba. Fidel Castro, who leads a revolution that is successful at the end of 58, and it goes through a period of being romanced by all sides, including the United Nations, and eventually he sides with the Soviet Union, the Soviet state. So the Soviet state has what it sees as a foothold in the new world, violating all understanding of the Monroe Doctrine and very much threatening as it remains to the United States of America. At the same time, Berlin is a problem for the United States because it is like an island in the Sea of Red in East Germany. That's 1962. But the crisis over the last two days, over the last two weeks, has been the photographs that show medium-range nuclear-tipped missiles deployed, ready to be deployed and possibly threatening the United States, not inconsistent with how the United States has forward-based missiles around the Soviet Union. But in any event, it's seen as a shock because there's an election coming up. Now, they've solved this. Khrushchev and Kennedy have exchanged. Bobby Kennedy has heroically come in negotiating with uh, a, a representatives of the, the, the Russian embassy, and they agree to take away the missiles, the real threat. The quarantine is off, and yet this is the 14th day. So, David, what are the problems this morning? We've solved the big one. they got good headlines. What are they worried about? Well, that's right. The headlines are saying that this is, that this is over. And what had happened is that Khrushchev the previous day had uh, delivered a radio broadcast saying, OK, we agree, we will remove the missiles. We agree what you call the offensive weapons from Cuba. So all they have from uh, from, uh, Khrushchev on the 14th day is a promise. And this is a promise from someone who has been shown to lie directly about this issue to the Americans before. I mean, he had been denying all along, his his foreign minister had been denying all along that they were installing missiles in Cuba. So they have this promise from someone that they're reluctant to trust. And the stakes are incredibly high, of course. So the first thing on their mind is to make sure that this wasn't just some trick, that Khrushchev wasn't issuing this promise just to let the Americans relax and therefore to buy time to make the missiles ready. Because if you look at the situation on the ground on the morning of the 14th day, nothing has changed. The missiles are still there. There are still about 42,000 Soviet troops. There are still hundreds of short-range nuclear missiles. There are still nuclear submarines around Cuba. And so the situation on the, ch- on the ground hasn't changed based on one promise that Khrushchev has delivered by radio. So the first thing the XCOM has to try and do is work out whether Khrushchev is going to follow through on his promise. You will all recall Ronald Reagan's proverb, Russian proverb, at the close of the Cold War, trust but verify. Verify is the challenge. The book is the 14th day, JFK and the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is by David Coleman based on the White House tapes and analysis of the White House tapes. When we come back, the backstory for this crisis, because it's not entirely about Cuba. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Bachelor, 
This is the John Bachelor Show. I'm speaking with David Coleman. His new book is The 14th Day, The Aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis, a profound aftermath because it colors the decisions made by several presidents for the next 40, 50, or 60 years. David is the chair of the Miller Center's Presidential Recordings Program. He's a history professor at the University of Virginia. David, the backstory includes Berlin, but it also includes the fact that Senator, uh, that Senator Kennedy, when he becomes president, is seen as a puppy, as a new guy on the world scene. And quickly, the Bay of Pigs catastrophe about Cuba, and then followed by the catastrophe at Vienna when Kennedy goes up against Khrushchev. What happened at Vienna? What about Berlin? Uh, colors the decisions made in the th- in the fort on the 14th day. Well, that's exactly right. This the, the Cuban Missile Crisis breaks about 18 months or so, uh, well, a little longer than 18 months into Kennedy's presidency. And up to that point, Kennedy's presidency had not been going especially well, especially on foreign policy. Um, at Vienna in June 1961, the previous year, he had agreed to meet with Khrushchev at a summer, summit meeting, and Khrushchev he, uh, Kennedy has essentially walked into a trap that Khrushchev used the opportunity to just kind of browbeat this young president. It came immediately after Kennedy's failures uh, to do with the Bay of Pigs operation. And so the American president at this point looks weak. Kennedy does not look uh, particularly strong in his own mind or in anyone else's mind. And so when the Cuban Missile Crisis breaks, it breaks on a particularly touchy subject for Kennedy. He's already looked weak on Cuba. This has been the scene already of his biggest foreign policy disaster. And so he really has to show resolve at this point on this issue above all. And Berlin, does he believe in uh, October of 62 that Khrushchev still means his threats about Berlin of the previous year? Yeah, this is one of the really interesting aspects of some of the new research that's coming out. In August of 1961... The Soviets had sealed off East Berlin, or West Berlin rather, they'd sealed around West Berlin with the Berlin Wall. And for a lot of people, that looked as though it was the end of the problem. But for Kennedy and his advisors, it was not the end of the problem. And for Khrushchev, it was not the end of the problem. And so going into 1962, in the summer of 1962, Khrushchev starts making all these threats about, we still have to solve the Berlin problem. I'm going to let you off until we get through the midterm elections, but after that we need to resolve it. And so Kennedy gets very sensitive about this issue halfway around the world, that somehow Khrushchev is going to try and force a a solution to the Berlin problem that could well end in nuclear war. And that's one of the things foremost on Kennedy's mind when he goes into the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so when he is there thinking during the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, what is it that Khrushchev's up to? Mm -hmm. He is looking halfway around the world and thinking, well, it must be about Berlin. That's the only thing that makes sense. Now, here's the fun part of history. David says we still are not clear all these years later why Khrushchev put those missiles into Cuba. What are the best theories, David? Yeah, um, the best theories are something, uh, are a mix to do with defending Cuba. Right. Are just general strength power play in the Cold War, right. uh, the chess game. In other words, retaliate. You move there, I move here. Yeah, and also this issue of Berlin. Now, exactly what the mix is, right. it's still unknown because Khrushchev said multiple things, and none of these on their own stand up entirely well to logic. Your analysis um, of Khrushchev is that he's a master opportunist. What does that mean, and how does it apply to the missile crisis? Right, this was... Uh, Khrushchev liked to set in motion traps and plays, but he also liked to turn on a dime and sort of seize an opportunity if he saw one arising. What this meant with the Cuban Missile Crisis is that he had actually started sending... He had convinced Castro to accept Soviet arms earlier in 1961, and this had been build-up had been going up through the summer of 1962. And so the best uh, evidence we have is that Khrushchev had one idea in mind when he started going into this, or at least sort of a a very vague notion of what he wanted to get out of this. But as he saw the situation change, as he thought more about it during the summer of 1962, he realized here is an opportunity for us to finally solve this Berlin issue that he had been bruised about before. He had had been forced to back down in 1958 and again in 1959. The building of the Berlin Wall wasn't really seen as a great victory for him. There's still 
uh, the, the situation was unresolved. And so he'd been saying for years, we need to solve this, we need to solve this, I'm going to solve it one way or another. And he had been uh, repeatedly rebuffed. And so as he's thinking about what this new situation in Cuba might be, he sees an opportunity there to force Kennedy's hand on, on uh, Berlin. And hence the uh, missile crisis, the discovery, the challenges, the presidential press conference during this high drama. If you have an opportunity, go to the YouTube tapes, review the president's statements, especially when he told the nation about the quarantine that he was putting on. They chose a middle route. The military's on one side and Adley Stevenson at the UN on another making challenges, but we're on the 14th day and afterwards. So I want to push this a little bit. Kennedy, right now, sitting at XCOM on the 29th of October and the next days, does he have any understanding or perception that Khrushchev uh, can control his right wing, his military advisors, uh, the people who in on the Presidium or in the Politburo and the Standing Committee might take advantage of this diplomacy and push a button? It's definitely one of Kennedy's fears, and one of the instructions he issues to his staff um, and advisors is that we are not going to celebrate this in the press. Oh. We need to be very quiet about this because what we do not want to do is force Khrushchev into public humiliation and therefore uh, force this leader of very powerful nation into an even more dire um, situation. And because he didn't want to push him and because Khrushchev had given off signals that he was ready to compromise, uh, and we'll just flag this because we'll come back to the media. Max Frankel publishes a piece the next day on the 30th of October, I believe, if I have my dates correct, uh, Professor. And that alarms Kennedy. Why? Kennedy, this particular one was uh, looking at what had happened. You can imagine immediately after the Cuban Missile Crisis, as after any major international crisis, the press clamors for the story. Right. And so this was one of a series of stories trying to work out what had happened in these ultra-secret meetings um, where the fate of the world was being decided. And so this particular, uh, this particular article had looked as though it was getting some inside information from people talking inside the XCOM. And Kennedy did not want information coming out from the XCOM. And one of the troublesome aspects of this particular article is that it was talking about um, whether or not uh, Kennedy was really willing to push the issue. If not, he was, whether if he, he was... To, it's, it actually suggests he's bluffing. Well, that's right, whether it was a bluff. And then, of course, that then is going to undermine his credibility with the Soviets. Um, and create more difficulties that way. And that happens on the 15th day, on the 30th of October. Now, Election Day is less than a week away, so we'll come to the election. But when we come back, I'm speaking with David Coleman. His book is The 14th Day. The immediate problem is that verify. And after that, what are they verifying? And won't you be surprised to learn how many nukes were on Cuba? I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. It's the 30th. It's the 1st of November, 2nd, 3rd. There's an election coming up. It's a by-election, but still significant for a first-term president who's beginning to think of re-election in, in two years. I'm with David Coleman. The 14th day is the book, and these are from secret tapes that the president made at his XCOM meeting as they discussed during the heat of the crisis and then afterwards the long, what you'd have to say, uh, post brief, debrief of what happened. David, verification. They'd used U-2. They'd lost one U-2 pilot when he'd been shot down by an SA-2 over Cuba. Uh, Castro had his body, but he's agreeing to return the body. How are they going to verify that the Soviets are getting the missiles out? Well, that's the big problem, and it's actually one of the most interesting aspects I found in doing this research and something that had been pretty much neglected before. The U-2s flew very, very high, about 11 miles up. And they were vulnerable. One had just been shot down, as you said. They had a, a way of getting better, clearer photos, and that was to send into low-level planes. 
and that was really the only option available to Kennedy at this point. Now these planes flew in very low, about 500 feet above, went in very fast and took photos of the sites and got very detailed photos. But the problem is they were vulnerable. They could be shot down not just by the Soviet SA-2s, but by Cuban artillery. And the decision that Kennedy is facing on the 14th day, the 15th day, the 16th day, over and over again, is, okay, do I send American pilots into harm's way to verify this? And then, if a plane is shot down, what are we going to do? Do we have a whole new crisis sparked up then? And so this is a recurring decision about whether or not to send American pilots into harm's way each day, and then sort of thinking through the consequences about what happens. They look for an alternative. You thought, who at this point is the General Secretary of the United Nations, offers to travel to Cuba and to meet with the Soviet representative and Castro's representative, and he offers to what? Uh, offer verification services, like he's a mini IEA. What does the president make, uh, what does XCOM make of a uh, Uthant's offer? Yeah, that we're actually willing to go along with it, having the United Nations do this inspection, if under certain conditions they had to have Americans on the plane, they had to be able to reliably count on the intelligence. What they did not want was to have the Soviets hijacking the UN verification. So they were willing under certain circumstances to go along with the United Nations verification, but that ultimately fell through for a number of reasons because one of the wild cards in this whole process is that Fidel Castro absolutely refused to allow uh, UN inspections or any other inspections in Cuba and kept threatening to shoot down American planes coming over the island. And this is sort of going on for weeks after the crisis. The U well. uh, Red Cross also offers to use neutral ships to inspect the cargo leaving, but this is going to take some weeks. So let's move on to another problem, which is the weapon systems. Uh, they have negotiated between Moscow, uh, the Kremlin and Washington over offensive weapons, uh, but that doesn't necessarily include all the weapons. What is the Aleutian 28 and what are the frogs, David? Yeah, well, this is known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that's the part that has been... Uh, most famously focused upon, but there were also these Aleutian 28s, which were long-range nuclear bombers that were very old, but they were still capable of carrying nuclear weapons, and they could easily um, reach with their range over Florida or the southeast in the United States. So they were still there. There were about 42, well, there were 42 of them in Cuba at the time. There were other short-range nuclear weapons, um, about five different types, but one of them was called FROGS, which was well, known to the Americans as FROGS, which is an acronym for Free Range Overground Rocket. And these were short-range rockets with about 25-mile range, but they could carry nuclear warheads. And so if the Americans decided they were going to invade Cuba, these were on the ground and potentially turning Cuba into a nuclear battlefield. And those were regarded at the time as defensive weapons on the battlefield. I know it's fantastic to imagine a nuclear weapon as a defensive weapon, but we had in our arsenal, I learned from David, the Honest John missile that was seen as a tactical nuclear weapon to be used by mobile uh, infantry or mobile armor on the battlefield. had a short range, but it had a nuke punch of about two kilotons. Uh, or more, depending on the warhead. And did we have a, an accurate count of how many frogs were in Cuba? No. Um, we didn't really have an accurate count of anything. Mm -hmm. um, but the frogs were particularly hard because they were small and the warheads were separate. But they discovered them late in the crisis. They didn't know in the beginnings, but they discovered them late in the crisis. It's one of the most place. dramatic moments, David, when I learned that the frogs had been deployed over Guantanamo, on the hills above Guantanamo, and that if the button had gone, Guantanamo went next. Right. Well, there's two particularly scary aspects here. One of them is comes back to what do they know, and they didn't even know about all of the long-range missiles. So there were 42 in Cuba, and American intelligence only ever found 33 of them. The second part of it is to do with these frogs, is that the Soviets... The original plan for, that Khrushchev had was that he was actually going to hand these over to Castro, which would have made Cuba a nuclear power overnight. In addition, the problems, these are the problems. Let's now flag what we uh, point again. Uh, Max Frankel on October 30th publishes what looks to be insider information. I learned from David that uh, Jack Kennedy and his administration, Bobby Kennedy, John McCone at uh, DCI, and others in the administration, uh, including some significant appointees, had been acting aggressive towards the press for some time, especially towards uh, members of the uh, reporting staff of the New York Times. Who is Hanson Baldwin, and how does he involve the Kennedys and worries of leaks? 
Yeah, Hanson Baldwin was a New York Times Pentagon reporter. In August of 1962, he had published a front-page New York Times article that was detailing American under, the, the understanding by American intelligence agencies about Soviet nuclear capabilities. The information on there could only have come from a very classified document known as National Intelligence Estimate. There was, there was no other place it could have come from. So there was clearly a leak. This sets in train... Um, sets in motion a train where basically the Kennedy is asking the CIA to spy on American journalists to try and plug these leaks. He tried the FBI, but Hoover hung up on him because he said, my boys don't get their hands dirty with That's right. They haven't been doing a great job. So he turns to the CIA to do this, which the CIA is uh, specifically prohibited from spying on Americans on American soil. And yet, does that delay the efforts to uh, to wiretap Hanson Baldwin? The wiretapping doesn't go into place for some time, and there are some other journalists that end up getting wiretapped as well by the CIA. There, there had been wiretaps by the FBI, but the CIA wiretaps didn't get in place for a while. Um, but there's still so little we know about it because a lot of this is still classified. We just the, the, we we get these snippets every now and then. But we don't know the full story. You say of we, the, the we also don't know who Hanson Baldwin's source was at, at Pentagon. There was a list of 700 people. You mentioned Gilpatrick. Wasn't he a part of XCOM? He was. Uh, we, yeah, the, the, the circumstantial evidence suggests it was Roswell Gilpatrick, who was the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, who was in the XCOM, um, probably was not trying to leak this maliciously. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's our best circumstantial evidence points to him. Your, uh, your recordings, as you pr- provide them in your manuscript, point to the fact that the president discussed this bluntly during these meetings about managing the news. I know that sounds like a familiar title these days with transparency and the Internet, and, what, and the White House is very careful on manufacturing what it wants the story to be. But this is 1962, and manufacturing the news or managing the news was a sensation. Who is Sylvester at the Department, Department of Defense? Yeah, Arthur Sylvester was the press secretary at the Department of Defense, and his big crime in this was being too honest. He was um, meeting with a reporter, a Washington reporter, where, uh, where he said, on the record, a government official, he said, well, of course we managed the news during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course we weren't giving you the whole story about press freedoms, about the White House controlling the story, about selectively misleading the press and things like that. And this is a, you know, it sounds like a naive kind of crisis to have these days, but at the time, this was a different era. This was the biggest crisis or controversy about uh, press freedoms and press information since World War II. There are, ca- there are members of the media here that are mentioned in David's book. It's always a joy. I must... F- I must mention Fletcher Knebel, who's writing for Look magazine and writes the, uh, with his uh, colleague Seven Days in May, which is the most sensational version of a standoff between the military and the executive. At the time, it's made into a wonderful mo- movie, black and white. Rod, Rod Serling wrote the screenplay, but that introduces the military. That's also a problem at XCOM. Maxwell Taylor, the military, the cha- chairman, sits at XCOM, but the Joint Chiefs do not. Uh, the president didn't trust them all through the crisis and afterwards. Why not, David? Yeah, Kennedy, of course, had been in the military and been in the Navy in World War II, but since becoming president had had intensely distrusted the, the advice he was getting from them. Part of it dates back to the Bay of Pigs debacle, where he, think, he thought he was ill-served by the advice he was getting from the military. Yeah, it feels like he's blaming Arlie Burke for his own mistake. In That's the, right. In the well, yes. He, he, he singled out certain people that... Yeah. Uh, that um, the, sort of the famous forward. Arlie Burke, uh, 30 not Arlie Burke, gets singled out. Go ahead, David. Yeah, and the other person that he particularly singles out is General Curtis LeMay, who at the time was the chief of staff of the Air Force, um, in which capacity he was also the head right. of the Strategic Air Command. So right. basically the person in charge of most of America's nuclear weapons. And Curtis LeMay, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, was giving Kennedy very hardline advice saying, this blockade that you're talking about is a bad idea. We need to go in and bomb them now, otherwise we're going to have war uh, one way or another. And was being very hard line about it and talking fairly cavalierly about uh, nuclear war and the prospects of, of that. O Plan 312 is the air attack. O Plan 316 is the ground attack. After the crisis, the 14th, 15th day, uh, through the election, ad, into November, when the president addresses the nation November 20th, are those plans still on the table, as we say here in the 21st century? They're 
Well, they, they still exist the, uh, in the form of contingency plans, but that's different from having from being um, something that Kennedy would likely have put in place. But that said, uh, what I'm talking about where it's unlikely, that's several weeks after the 13th day. So for several weeks, the, the military is still building up, and it's not until November 15th, 1962, where they come in and say, right, we're ready. If you order an invasion, we're finally ready to do this. If the IL-28 issue, if the verification and everything else falls through, we can go in and do this. Uh, when we come back, uh, the November 20th press conference and moving, this is after the election, and moving into the new year with the problems that remain, which is perception, of course, and 60 years later, it's always going to be perception with a crisis where nukes were primed. Castro with nukes. David, David Coleman is the author of a new book, The 14th Day, JFK and the Aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. David Coleman is the author of an exciting book. This is as dramatic as it gets. Hollywood can't touch this stuff. You've heard about the 13 days. This takes us from October 29th, the day after all the, all the world thought the crisis was over, including Mr. Coleman's family and parents because he was in Australia. Well, actually, he wasn't here yet, but in Australia. Everybody thought it was over, right, David? It was solved on the Exactly, yeah. Yes. And it wasn't. And the crisis verification, the Ilyushin 28 bombers, the frog, short-range missiles with nuclear tips. But now we come to November 20th. The president is going to give a press conference, answer questions. Everybody's relieved. His um, approval ratings are soaring. Uh, in the election, the Democrats have only lost five seats in the House. They've gained two in the Senate. Richard Nixon is defeated in California. The president is feeling vigorous, and he presents himself not at the White House because they don't have enough big enough room for this press corps. And there's a wonderful picture in David's book about what media was like in 1962, but at the State Department. What is the president's mission that day? What does he want to convey, David? What he wants to do is put a line under the Cuban Missile Crisis and show that he's in control because... The election is over, but he is, there is still a lot of very loud grumbling, from, particularly from Republicans, saying, you've been duped by Khrushchev, that the Soviets are still have all of these missiles hidden in caves in Cuba. And this is turning up on the front pages of newspapers. This has not gone away. Kennedy wants to put an end to all of that discussion um, because this is part of a much bigger uh, narrative that's going on in this time about Kennedy trying to control the story because Republicans want to paint the Cuban Missile Crisis as a great Kennedy failure. Kennedy, of course, wants to paint this as a great victory. And this battle is raging as, as of November 20th, 1962, and it really doesn't get put to rest for about another three months in, into February 1963. It feels that the president is projecting a confidence that is not based on the facts. He doesn't know how many missiles are still there, nor does he know that, uh, that the Soviets aren't playing a game of of uh, like three-card Monty switching. That's right. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of trust um, being built in. To what he's saying, but uh, he's trying to project confidence that the intelligence community is giving him all the information they need to make these decisions. The uh, new the year ends at the end of '62. An exhausted public. Uh, we didn't have so, uh, we didn't have col the Cold War break into a hot war, and the president begins the new year with uh, the media turning on him as in less than effective. This is the January 24th line. Why are they arguing against him, and what can he do about it? And is Adlai Stevenson the problem? Uh, no, Adlai Stevenson's not really the problem at this point. Um, a lot of this stems back to the backlash from the White House trying to control the press. Reporters mm -hmm. don't like being told that they're being fed information. Um, and so there was this, it's, it's, it, you can't really understate the, 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 the depth of anger that this news management controversy uh, stirred up. And so the, a lot of this, and it's also important to remember that our 50 years later, it looks as though Kennedy's presidency is one of the best presidencies ever. If you poll Americans these days, about eight in 10 will poll, will say that John F. Kennedy is the best American president since World War II. But if you put yourself in 1962 or even early 1963, Kennedy's presidency hasn't accomplished a whole lot. 
Um, and so the, the, the record of accomplishment is fairly thin. So reporters were picking up on that, saying that your legislative record is thin. Yes, you've had this big victory with the Cuban Missile Crisis, but perhaps you in your own way contributed to the crisis in the first place. Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, John McCone, DCI, they are at odds in February because they still can't validate that the Soviets have pulled out the um, uh, the arsenal that will be damaging. My notes here say, David, MiGs, Luna, and submarine base, all still in place in February of 63. That's right. As of November and November 20th, Kennedy had decided there are some things we're going to live with, that we will make sure they get out the IL-28 bombers, we will make sure they get out the missiles, but the rest of it we can live with. Um, and critics had picked up on this and were attacking the administration for it. Now, John McCone was the director of central intelligence, was very tight with Republican circles. He had been in the Eisenhower administration. He was very tight with, with Republicans on the Hill. And so there was deep suspicion by Kennedy and his brother, Robert Kennedy, that, Robert, that John McCone was perhaps leaking information to Republican critics on the Hill during this period as well. During the November, right after the election, November 17th, the president made remarks and he met secretly, secretly with uh, Eisenhower, who had to be briefed on this crisis, Dwight Eisenhower, the famous general, the one everybody still looked up to and measured Kennedy by. And they brought in McCone to do the briefing. Ike listened to what had happened, where they were of the verification. What did Ike say or write? What do we have in his diaries about his doubts in November? Very little coming from Eisenhower himself. Um, he had taken the position once the crisis broke that he was going to rally behind the president. Um, and so the evidence, you know, I've been through the files at the Eisenhower Library on this period, and there's not a lot coming from Eisenhower himself. But at that meeting, which was at Dulles Airport, the opening of the airport in Washington, John McCone says something very interesting as part of the briefing. He says, we are always going to have a missiles in Cuba problem. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to remember, this is three weeks after everyone thinks the Cuban Missile Crisis is over and solved. And the, the concern about missiles, he's speaking metaphorically. He's talking about a threat over the next decades. And he was right, wasn't he, David? He was, because, as, um, because Kennedy had decided to take out some of the missiles, some of the, the long-range ones and the bombers, but they had left all of the frogs that we were talking about earlier. They had left, they had decided that they could keep a lot of the short-range tactical weapons that could not reach the United States, that they, they were not going to push the Soviets to get those out. All right, here we are in, in early 1963. The, the president will not live the year. Uh, there is a, a poignant exchange right after the election when the president calls John Connolly, just elected governor of Texas, who will eventually become a Republican under the Nixon administration. But at the time, um, Connolly had won but had been beaten up in the city of Dallas. And the president says on tape, on this tape that David has available because the president recorded his phone calls, I don't wa know why we do anything for Dallas. It's a very chilling remark. But I want to come to how the president measured his people after the crisis. Uh, David, did the president learn from this that XCOM was a success? Did he ever uh, say that to anyone after the end of the fury? Um, not specifically about the XCOM, although he did keep it in operation for several months, or at least through 1963. Well, he, he kept it in for the rest of his presidency, rather. Um, there were certain people that he took from this episode uh, the lessons that they could be trusted. And the, probably the one who was elevated most in there was Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense. The Cuban Missile Crisis really elevates Robert McNamara and Kennedy's mind, that this is someone that I need to have giving me good advice. Um, he, the president liked having Robert Kennedy there to listen to. The 14th day, David Coleman is the author, JFK and the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And if you're pushing to the edge of your seat saying, trust McNamara, what about Vietnam? That is the right question. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.